Thanks to Dollar Shave Club for sponsoring this video. Go to dollarshaveclub.com forward slash geographics to get your starter set for just $5. It's the bloodiest battle ever fought on American soil. From July the 1st to July the 3rd, 1863, the Battle of Gettysburg raged in an anonymous corner of Pennsylvania, pitching the Confederate forces of Robert E. Lee against the Union Army of the Potomac. It saw some 160,000 troops clash in a history-changing dust-up. Over the course of three days, 7,058 soldiers were killed, with another 44,000 wounded or captured. Outside of World War II's worst battle, no other single event has definitively taken so many American lives. Pearl Harbor, 9-11, the Tet Offensive, all of these are mere drops in an ocean of blood compared to Gettysburg. Yet the story of Gettysburg is more than just the story of one spectacularly violent battle. More even than just the story of a war, it's the story of two visions for America, fighting for legitimacy, and of all the mistakes that led to the South and the North breaking apart. But it's also the story of one particular town in one particular corner of America that, for three brief days, found itself at the crossroads of history. Today we're visiting the most famous battlefield in America and discovering what led to those days of carnage. The twisting path that led to Gettysburg started not with the birth of the Confederacy or even with the birth of the United States, but rather with one family making one simple purchase. In 1736, the descendants of William Penn, aka the guy Pennsylvania is named after, decided to buy some extra land from the Iroquois Indians. Known as Marsh Creek, the Penns soon opened it up to European settlers. It was from these humble beginnings that Gettysburg would eventually be born. Note the key word there, eventually. Before they could found Gettysburg, the new settlers would have to experience unfathomable violence. In 1754, George Washington, yep, that George Washington, was sent to demand the French dismantle their frontier forts. Instead, the great general made the not-so-great mistake of getting captured, inadvertently triggering the French and Indian War. Despite what hack stories you might believe, being a settler in colonial times didn't normally involve having your cabin attacked by bands of Indians. Unless, that is, those Indians just happened to be allied to the France your English overlords were currently fighting. Over the nine years the war lasted, a number of settlers in the future site of Gettysburg Gettysburg had their homes burned or were killed in raids. Yet the intermittent violence in this part of Pennsylvania didn't scare everyone off. On the contrary, some folks thrived. Folks like Samuel Gettys. In 1761, Gettys set up a tavern on the crossroads of some major tracks running through the region. His plan was to take advantage of passing travelers and build up his business, and, well, boy, did it ever work. When the war concluded in 1763, people began flooding through, all of whom were apparently seriously thirsty, because Gettys' tavern business, it by 1786, his son, James Gettys, had laid out plots for 210 homes and a town square on the land around his father's tavern. The name he chose for this flourishing town? Well, you guessed it. That was Gettysburg. By now, the 13 colonies had won their independence from Britain, and the frontier was bristling with optimism. Like other new towns, Gettysburg began to grow at a rapid pace. By 1800, it had become the county seat. A few years later, on March 10, 1806, it was officially incorporated as a township. Jump ahead to 1860, and it was a bustling place of 2,100 residents. There were tanneries, shoemakers, manufactories. Ten major roads now passed through, bringing trade and money. In short, Gettysburg in 1860 had everything a mid-19th century town could ask for. And that was a problem, because by 1860, America was already standing on the brink of war. And when it finally came, that war was going to hit Gettysburg so hard, it would make the French and Indian War look like a teddy bear's picnic.
While Gettysburg was busy building its tanneries and getting all prosperous, the US at large was approaching breaking point. The thing that would finally cause it to snap was a little line in the Declaration of Independence when a bunch of guys had heralded the birth of their new nation by declaring, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal only to then decide that some were more equal than others and therefore slavery was still totally cool. At first, anti-slavery types had hoped that this was an anomaly and the US would quickly course correct. But the opposite happened. More and more slaves were brought in chains until the institution began to fray the bonds holding the free and slave states together. The first major test of these bonds came in 1820. Over the previous few years, Missouri had repeatedly tried to gain entry into the Union, only to be rebuffed because the 22 slave and free states were perfectly balanced. To get around this, some congressmen from free states had tried to pass laws requiring Missouri to slowly emancipate its slaves after joining. This only served to make the slave states angry. When Missouri reapplied again in 1819, the political fight became as bitter as cyanide. Writing at the time, Thomas Jefferson described the rancor as being as frightening as a fireball in the night. Divisions opened up that became chasms that became a howling void, separating people who felt they could no longer trust one another. Think just how divided and partisan the US can seem right now, and then multiply that by a thousand. That was the atmosphere in 1820. The only reason the pot didn't boil over and blow up the whole damn kitchen is thanks to Henry Clay. A moderate senator from Kentucky, Clay was a man so determined to sit on the fences of any debate that it's a wonder he didn't develop hemorrhoids. Under his direction, Congress passed the Missouri Compromise, which allowed Missouri to come in complete with slaves, but also invited Maine in as a free state. Importantly, the compromise also fixed a permanent border for slavery in the U.S. From now on, any states admitted north of Missouri would have to be free. And although everyone accepted Clay's compromise, with some grumbling, it was really just an exercise in kicking the highly explosive can down the road. Come 1849, that can was ready to detonate all over again. That year, California applied to enter the Union as a free state, once again upsetting the balance. You know that old adage, the definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over again but expecting different results? Well, it's opposite, doing the same thing over and over again and indefinitely expecting the same result could also work as a pretty good definition of the insanity that the US was experiencing. Faced with the new crisis, Henry Clay tried to replay his compromise trick from 1820. But while his original bill had been a bitter pill everyone reluctantly swallowed, his sequel was more like shoveling manure directly into their throats. The Compromise of 1850 was such a dog's breakfast that you could bag it up and sell it as kibble. Among its tortured provisions, it promised to admit California as a free state, but also pass a Fugitive Slave Act forcing free states to return escaped slaves. It promised to ban the slave trade in the District of Columbia, but also keep slave owning legal. Finally, it agreed to let the new territories of Utah and New Mexico vote on the slave issue for themselves. This time, nobody was happy with Clay's compromise. Those in the free states were horrified by the Fugitive Slave Act and the free vote in the territories, while those in slave states were angry about admitting a giant free state like California. If Henry Clay had successfully kicked the can down the road in 1820, this time he barely managed to make it roll a few meters. In less than half a decade, his latest compromise would finally explode in everyone's faces. But just before we get into how all of that goes horribly wrong, a quick word from today's sponsor, Dollar Shave Club. Dollar Shave Club covers all of your grooming needs, shower care, oral care, deodorants, and of course, most importantly, shaving. Now, I don't shave my beard, obviously, but I do shave my head, and that experience has become a whole lot better since I switched to Dollar Shave Club before. I'd either use cheap razors and have a bad time cutting my head, or I'd buy the expensive razors, and then I'd, you know, it would shave well, 
but I'd feel bad about how much money I'd spent. Dollar Shave Club sent me their ultimate shave starter set. It's got the razor and blades, of course. This thing is an executive six blade version. It's also got this great trimmer on the back for, you know, getting the uh, more tricky places. Then it comes with these things you need. There's the prep scrub for beforehand. Then, of course, there is the shave butter for during. And then after that, you've got the post-shave dew. Now, I don't know how this works on a face, but my head gets a bit dry when I shave, and this uh, hydrates it really well, so that's pretty solid. So if you visit dollarshaveclub.com forward slash geographics, you'll get the ultimate starter set for just $5, and you can round out your grooming routine by adding any of their other high-quality products. After that, the restock box ships full-size products at the regular price, so get started with Dollar Shave Club. There's a link below, and let's get back to the video. On April the 11th, 1861, three grim-faced men boarded a boat in Charleston Harbor and sailed out to a meeting with destiny. Just ahead of them lay an anomaly, a U.S. fort off the South Carolina coast that now existed as an enclave for enemy territory. It had been just 11 years since Henry Clay's last compromise, and everything had changed. The first warning tremor had come as early as 1854. That year, the Kansas-Nebraska Act had been signed, allowing both states to enter the Union and then vote on whether or not to allow slavery. And no, your American geography doesn't deceive you. Nebraska is definitely to the north of Missouri, blowing a hole right through Clay's 1820 compromise. In preparation for the vote, free state militias and pro-slavery settlers had all moved into Kansas, desperate to sway things in their favor. And so had begun the low-intensity civil war known as Bleeding Kansas. Running from 1854 to 1859, Bleeding Kansas saw both pro-slavery mobs loot and destroy towns and anti-slavery militias assassinate settlers from the South. By the time it ended, around 56 people were dead. But it wasn't the numbers that made it so significant as the loathing it generated on both sides. Loathing that would soon become turbocharged. Three years after Bleeding Kansas erupted, the Supreme Court ruled on a case related to slavery in such a shockingly partisan way that it split the last bonds between free and slave states. The Dred Scott decision firstly ruled that the Missouri Compromise was unconstitutional and that the states in the North had a right to be slave states. Secondly, it ruled that African Americans were not and could never be U.S. citizens. For anyone not chillaxing on their cotton plantation, the ruling was like Chief Justice Roger Taney had personally kicked them in the testicles. But the slave states had nothing to smile about either, because Taney's ruling had just handed a brand new party the political gift it had been waiting for. Formed on March the 20th, 1854, the Republican Party was a home for disaffected anti-slavery northerners. Had the Dred Scott decision not been passed, had Bleeding Kansas not happened, it's possible they'd have just faded into obscurity. But the 1850s were like stuffing a firecracker up the arses of anyone even remotely ambivalent about slavery. Terrified the whole U.S. would soon become a shining plantation upon a hill whose beacon light guided racists everywhere, northern voters flocked to the new party. The result was a tight win for Abraham Lincoln in the 1860 election, the first man to ever win the presidency without support from the South. For the southern slave states, Lincoln's election, it was just too much. On December the 20th, South Carolina seceded from the Union, specifically citing Lincoln's anti-slavery credentials. The following month, Mississippi, Florida, Alabama, Georgia, and Louisiana jumped ship. On February the 1st, Texas went too. Three days later, the Confederate States of America was born. Orders went out to take over all forts held by United States soldiers. Which is how, on April the 11th, 1861, three men found themselves sailing across Charleston Harbor to the last holdout in South Carolina, Fort Sumter. As the men arrived, the garrison commander, Major Robert Anderson, came out to meet them. The Confederate representatives ordered Anderson to evacuate Sumter. But they also promised safe passage to the North and that the soldiers would be allowed to salute the Stars and Stripes as they left. After all, they told Anderson, you have upheld so long under the most trying circumstances. Anderson thanked the men for their fair, manly, and courteous terms, but told them, It is a demand with which I regret that my sense of honor and of my obligation to my government prevent my compliance. The three men nodded, then politely took their leave. As they sailed away, the fate of America was sealed. The very next day, South Carolina militiamen, loyal to the Confederacy, bombarded Fort Sumter. The last bonds had broken. The Civil War was here.
By the time it ended, over 620,000 people would be dead. But what, you might now be wondering, of Gettysburg? When we last left the town, it was 1860, and Gettysburg was flourishing nicely, a haven from all the bad politics swirling around. So what had happened during the Civil War? So close to the Mason-Dixon line, it must have been invaded like a gazillion times, right? Well, no. For most of the Civil War, the Confederacy fought from a defensive posture, meaning battles mostly took place in states like Virginia. In the whole of the war, the North only suffered a couple of invasions and a couple of raids, all of which had completely passed the Keystone State by. So, in summer 1863, there was nothing that would have made the citizens of Gettysburg worry that they might have two gigantic armies come crashing down on them. Unfortunately, that illusion of safety was about to be proven just that – an illusion. Below the Mason-Dixon line, Robert E. Lee was looking to cap off a triumphal year. The previous September, he had launched an invasion of Maryland that had failed, resulting in Antietam, the bloodiest single-day battle of the Civil War. Since then, though, he had won a string of handy victories, including crushing the Union at the Battle of Chancellorsville. Now Lee was looking to invade the North once more, and this time he'd do it right. Lee's plan was simple. First, he wanted to move the fighting out of devastated Virginia. Second, he wanted to take food and supplies from Pennsylvania. Thirdly, and most importantly, he wanted to win a major victory in the North and force a negotiated end to the war. On June the 3rd, Lee set off at the head of 75,000 men. On June the 15th, he crossed the Potomac River, entering Maryland and Union Territory. He wasn't alone. Major General Joseph Hooker's 90,000-man strong Union Army of the Potomac was trailing him at a distance. But Hooker was reluctant to force a fight and instead let Lee march onwards north. When word got back to Lincoln, he furiously replaced Hooker with Major General George Gordon Meade. But by now, it was too late. In the dying days of June, Lee marched into Pennsylvania, marking the first Confederate invasion of a free state. Shortly after, he got winds that Major General Meade was in pursuit, so Lee ordered his army to concentrate around a convenient, defensible town, one which part of his army had already reached. That town, of course, was Gettysburg. And it's here that we have the joy of wading into a surprisingly heated historical controversy. Was the Battle of Gettysburg fought over shoes? On June the 30th, the first of Lee's divisions arrived at Gettysburg, including one led by Major General Henry Heath. Heath ordered his men to search the town for supplies, specifically shoes. A small force, under a guy named Pettigrew, went to check out some Gettysburg shoe stores and wound up bumping into some Union troops. And so you have the story that the Battle of Gettysburg was fought over shoes. But make no mistake, Lee was concentrating his army around the town. The Army of the Potomac was heading towards him. While it was a search for shoes that triggered the battle, there was going to be a major dust-up here regardless. The day after the quick shoe skirmish on June the 30th, Heath's men again bumped into Union troops. At 7.30 a.m. on July the 1st, the first shot was fired. But rather than a small skirmish, this time the fighting quickly snowballed into something much bigger. When General Lee got word that Heath was ignoring his orders to simply amass at Gettysburg, he was forced to make a quick choice. Send the reinforcements in or risk losing Heath's division. What else could the general do? He sent the reinforcements, and so began the bloodiest battle ever fought on American soil. One of the interesting myths about Gettysburg is that the first day was a minor fight before the carnage. While day one was comparatively bloodless, it was only in the sense that, say, the Jonestown Massacre was comparatively bloodless compared to 9-11. 50,000 troops clashed, leaving 16,000 dead, wounded, or missing. Even if the fighting had stopped here, day one of Gettysburg would still be one of the biggest battles of the Civil War. But of course, it didn't stop, and things quickly went from bad to worse. As the fighting erupted, the Confederate army came rolling into town, pushing the Union troops back. In the face of Lee's well-oiled fighting machine, the Army of the Potomac raced for the cover of Cemetery Hill. Lee actually ordered an attack on the hill, but Confederate General Richard S. Ewell bottled it at the last moment, convinced the Union position was too strong. Sadly for Ewell, it was only going to get stronger. 
That night, as both armies waited for the dawn, four more Union corps arrived. At the same time, Lee's forces swelled as everyone converged on Gettysburg. As dawn broke on July the 2nd, Lee took a good look at the army's relative positions. Then he ordered a direct attack to dislodge the Union. At 4 p.m., the Confederate advance began in earnest. It was a slaughter. Seriously, there is no other word for it. Over the next few hours, a relentless forward attack by Lee would leave another 18,000 men dead, wounded, or captured. The Union forces were sent running from most of their positions, beaten back from nearly all the ground they'd fortified. But not all of it. As night fell on day two of Gettysburg, Lee could see the Union troops still just about clinging on at Little Round Top, Culp's Hill, and East Cemetery Hill. The darkness shrouding the battlefield was a blow to the Confederate general, who was sure had been mere hours from victory. Sadly for the Confederacy, this belief would be what led to their defeat. On the third day, the bloodshed finally reached its climax. Just nine years earlier, in 1854, British forces in the Crimean War had sent a cavalry brigade on a suicidal charge against Russian artillery, wiping them out. By 1863, the charge of the Light Brigade was already shorthand for a doomed, noble, and pointless action in war. Little could Lee know that he was about to top it. At 3 p.m. on July the 3rd, Lee rolled everything on smashing the Union lines with a final assault. Thinking his enemies on the verge of crumbling, he sent 15,000 troops racing up Cemetery Hill, led by George Pickett. But Pickett's charge was no more glorious than the Light Brigades had been. The Confederate troops, who ran towards the Union lines, found themselves being fired on from all sides. The massacre was like something from World War I, with soldiers simply being mown down. By the time the retreat was sounded, fewer than half of the 15,000 men were still standing. Pickett's charge was the death knell for Lee's second invasion of the North. The next day, the general turned around and led his broken army out of Gettysburg. By now, over 7,000 men lay dead. Photos of the bodies lying in open fields or piled up in woodland still exist as haunting as the day they were taken. But while the Battle of Gettysburg might have been over, the story wasn't. Because there's one other thing people think about when they hear the word Gettysburg, aside from battle. Yes, it's time to talk about the Gettysburg Address. Today, the Battle of Gettysburg is recognized as a major turning point in the Civil War. Combined with the Union victory at Vicksburg just one day after, it effectively sealed the fate of the Confederacy. But that's not how the residents of Gettysburg saw it. No, all they saw was just a colossal waste of human life. In the town, every field, every garden, every free patch of land was stuffed with corpses. Churches, private homes, schools, all had been turned into makeshift hospitals for over 20,000 wounded troops. As far as the residents were concerned, somebody needed to do something, and fast. In the late summer, they began petitioning Pennsylvania Governor Andrew Curtin to build a proper cemetery. The idea wasn't just to clear Gettysburg of the dead, it was to create a place where soldiers, specifically Union soldiers, could be honored for their sacrifice. To make this wish come true, Curtin selected Gettysburg lawyer David Wills. Wills was the guy responsible for buying the land, for getting in the landscape architects to design it, and for dealing with the opening ceremony. As the summer gave way to fall and the cemetery neared its completion, Wills decided that a memorial site of this significance needed an equally significant figure to dedicate it. Someone with gravitas and a way with words. Someone with a stature to give an address that would echo through history. Someone like Edward Everett. Yes, the actual official Gettysburg speech was done by some dude you've never heard of. And dear God, did Wills get his money's worth. Everett wrote a speech that clocked in at two hours, a length of time that's pushing it for a superhero crossover film, let alone a speech. It was only when November the 2nd, 1863 rolled around that Wills seems to have thought, hey, maybe we should get someone important in. So Wills messaged the president, asking him to make a few appropriate remarks. To everybody's amazement, Lincoln said yes. From our 21st century perspective, it seems obvious that Lincoln would be expected to speak at Gettysburg, the site of one of the key battles of the war. But in the fall of 1863, that wasn't the case. Although it was becoming clear that the Confederacy was now spent, the war wasn't over. 
Even as late as mid-1864, the South would be capable of attacking Washington, D.C. Then there was the fact that Lincoln had proclaimed he wouldn't leave the capital until the war was over. Not even in your paranoid uncle's worst nightmares of government overreach does the District of Columbia include southern Pennsylvania. Yet go, Lincoln did. Famously, he finished writing the address on the train to Gettysburg. When he finally stood up at the end of Edward Everett's snooze fest, he spoke for only two minutes, saying a mere 275 words. Yet those 275 words changed everything. Aside from including both the most famous opening line of any speech, and to date the only one to feature in a Bill and Ted's movie, the Edisburg Address was a remarkable bit of political footwork. By appealing to ideals, Lincoln raised the Civil War above a factional fight over states' rights, turning it into something bigger, a war fought over what kind of nation the United States would be. It's been said that parts of the Gettysburg Gettysburg Address read more like a prayer, and it almost is one. It's a prayer for a reunited United States. Perhaps it's no surprise that those 275 words quickly became famous. Still, Lincoln would never live to see the promise of his address fulfilled, and neither will we today. Our video story ends with Lincoln sitting back down after showing Everett how a real speech is made, and normality at last returning to Gettysburg. Yet the anonymity this corner of Pennsylvania once enjoyed would never come back. For the last 160-odd years, Gettysburg has remained one of the most famous places on Earth, its name recognizable to anyone with even a passing knowledge of American history. In some ways, this is to be expected. Gettysburg remains one of the bloodiest battles the U.S. ever fought, killing more soldiers than even the taking of Iwo Jima. In other ways, though, Gettysburg's enduring fame points to something even more poignant. It was here, outside this small town, that the future of the U.S. was decided, not just with fighting, but with words, too. The U.S. may have sometimes struggled to live up to it, but it was here that Lincoln's ideal of a perfect nation was truly articulated. A nation united, in which all men, no matter the color of their skin, could be free. If we remember places, what they represent, then what Gettysburg represents is both a nightmare and a powerful dream. A dream of a renewed and fairer America reborn. It might have been a slaughter. It might have ended over 7,000 lives. But ultimately, the carnage at Gettysburg would come to symbolize something beyond mere death and destruction. Hope for the future. A hope we're still trying to live up to today. So I really hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, please do like this video. Please do subscribe to this channel. Turn on that notification bell so you find out when we put out a new video. Also, if you want to support what we're doing here, please do support our sponsor, Dollar Shave Club, who I've linked to below. And thank you for watching.